So anyway, of course, we're going to, of course, continue, like I said, talking about ancient China. I'm going to, of course, wrap up uh, discussing that topic today. Um, primarily, what I'm doing, of course, is I'm going to talk about probably a couple more dynasties uh, in ancient China. Most of them I'm going to talk about the, I've got the um, Qin or Qin dynasty. I'll go into that one. I'll go into that one first, the Qin or Qin dynasty. Um, and I'll go to the Han dynasty, and I will spend a few minutes also talking about the Tang dynasty that they also had as well, which kind of peaks during the so-called golden age of China. So I'll go through that, and I will spend a few minutes reviewing over uh, the rest of the material for this period uh, that we're talking about. So anyway, um, ancient China, of course, uh, went through a period I think we kind of covered before which was called the period of the warring states. Uh, I think it's about where we were before. And we had been talking about also in the previous lecture on Monday uh, about um, the different um, Chinese schools of thought, like Confucianism, Taoism, uh, that came about. That all kind of happened in the spring and autumn period. And then you have this period of the warring states, which came at the end of the Eastern Chow period uh, in ancient China. You had a case where China broke up into all these competing states, vassal-type warlike states, uh, and there were about seven of them that were dominant, uh, so-called seven warring states. They had some minor ones as well that were part of it, but these are the seven that fought over China uh, from the 5th to about the 3rd century B.C., so 481 to 221 B.C., and uh, Ken, Qi, Chu, Yan, Han, Zhao, Way those are the seven, of course, warring states uh, that were pretty much fighting it out. Of course, we'll get to it later. One of them, of course, that takes over the whole, you know, you know, China will be one called Qin or Qin, which is the first one you see in that list. So they're going to eventually conquer the whole thing uh, and merge it as one empire. Uh, and of course, I'll talk about that famous emperor that kind of comes in there and takes over the one they said in the video which is Emperor Chen Shi. So, yeah, let me get into, uh, of course, uh, Ken. Ken, of course, uh, started out as a kingdom. So it wasn't really an empire uh, initially. So you have the so-called Ken dynasty, uh, which did not reign very long. You can see it only reigned a couple decades, uh, mostly. But the kingdom itself went back before that, uh, back to about the mid-3rd century B.C., and uh, over time, it grew stronger and stronger until it was able to conquer and annex all the other states into one state. And that became, of course, known as the Chinese Empire uh, that, of course, was found, which would be called the Qin Empire, I guess you want to call it that. And which it's where the word, you know, like I say, where the word comes from, uh, Qin or Qin is where you get the word China. Um of course, you can see there, they've already talked about the ruler that would take power, which is Ken Shi Wang Di, uh, which his name, of course, uh, in Chinese means first emperor of China. Yeah, come on in. Hey, uh, how's that going? Um, so you have, of course, the first emperor of China, Chen Shi Wang Di. He's called different names, uh, Emperor Chen, Emperor Qin, um, Emperor Chen Shi. So he's called all kinds of names. Uh, the name Wang Di on the end means uh, emperor. And so his whole name supposedly means first emperor of China or first emperor of the Qin, uh, basically. So he founded the kingdom and dynasty originally. Uh, and then from there, he was able to merge it into an empire. And so he was the first emperor of China from about 221 to 210 BC. And it was a dynasty because it had like, two of his sons that reigned after he died. He died in about 210. His two sons reigned from about 210 to about 206 BC, but we'll talk about it later. He wasn't a very popular ruler um, overall. Uh, most of China that he unified, you can see in that map in the middle, uh, was mostly the eastern central part of it. So China itself at the time isn't made up of all of China later. You know, China expands over time. Uh, but predominantly, they just have like maybe one third of China, maybe, maybe uh, at that time. It's all the area that's kind of below the Great Wall of China. 
uh, which you'll this ruler will start building, of course, later. Uh, I think I've got a few other slides um, on Chen Shi Wang Di. Uh, there's, of course, that one. But, uh, of course, they have this main slide, which is right here if you want to look at that later. Uh, his main things he's known for, of course, is his construction of the Great Wall of China. I'll talk about that first. Uh, he also is known for his capital city uh, that he built in China. Then we'll get to the Terracotta Army. Uh, which was part of his mausoleum that he constructed, which the video kind of went into. Uh, if you missed that, you can go back and watch the beginning of this lecture. So Chen Shi, uh, kind of get more, uh, and I'll get more into legalism, which he was also one of the ones that started it uh, as well. Chen Shi, of course, the first thing we'll talk about, so he, of course, was the one that was famous for beginning the construction of the Great Wall of China. Uh, China had built fortifications before, uh, going back to this, really to the period of the Warring States. China had already constructed some walls to block certain states from each other uh, when they were fighting wars against each other. And then what Chen Shi did, uh, he basically built a earthen ram type wall made of earth or mud, uh, was constructed on their northern border. Um, and he started building this, uh, they think, sometime at the end of the 3rd century B.C. They're not sure how many workers were involved, but if 700,000 workers were being used to build his mausoleum. You can imagine that to build the Great Wall, it must have been over a million people uh, overall. Uh, why did they construct the Great Wall of China? That's been asked a lot, of course, over the years. Uh, you can see there on that slide, it says it was built to block foreign barbarians uh, such as the Shang Nu, which is true. Uh, they mostly blocked it from invaders that were in either Mongolia or in the Mongolian steppe, which is kind of between Mongolia and China. And these um, barbarians started invading into northern, northern China uh, using horses, uh, to cross the Gobi Desert and into there. And yeah, they were called Shang Nu, which I've got a um, kind of a transliteration I put in there. So you got Shang and then you got Nu. Uh, you can see in that. And uh, these nomads um, didn't just fight on horseback. They were known for using the composite bow, which they were pretty good at. If you watch that documentary I've got for you, they go into great detail talk about them, how they were such a threat to the Chinese. And um, they fought with also like swords and probably spears. Uh, and it's been debated about how they're related to the Mongols. Uh, some people think they're kind of like somehow descended from them. And then some also believe, historians believe that the um, Shang Nu may have been the ancestors of the Huns, which, you know, later attacked Europe. You've heard of Attila the Hun, right? They think that Attila and the Huns may have been somehow related back to the Shang Nu. In fact, the word Hun supposedly came from the word Shang Nu, like a variation of it. Uh, so the Great Wall was a fortification, but it was a linear fortification. It basically was built from east to west. Uh, eventually, you'll see later, it'll start where the Yellow Sea is and goes westward across the northern border of China all the way to the Gobi Desert, which is several thousand miles uh, in length. So they went out, out of their way to really construct this fortification to block them uh, from trying to break through uh, and all of that. Instead of having to fight pitched battles with them, which I guess weren't going very well uh, at the time. Uh, yeah, they're not sure about the miles on it. Of course, you'll watch that documentary and they claim that all the walls combined, it's like something like, I forget how far, 50,000 or some crazy amount they say in the video. I forget how much they said originally that it could have been because all these different dynasties over 2,000 years built, you know, successive walls uh, over time. And uh, they do think that the walls themselves are at least three to 4,000 miles in length from east to west across the northern border of China. Uh, that's why the Chinese call it the 10,000 Li Wall. Uh, 10,000 Li 
uh, in Chinese is 5,000 kilometers. So 5,000 kilometer wall. So if you do the math on that, uh, 5,000 kilometers in miles is about three something thousand miles. So it's, it's between three and 4,000 uh, roughly. Now I'll get to the Ming Wall a little later in a few minutes. But the Ming Wall is about that long, somewhere between three and 4,000 miles long. Uh, others call it the Chinese Wall. Uh, of course, my, uh, in modern times, Europeans and other foreigners came to China. They started calling it the Great Wall. You know, so the name kind of stuck uh, afterwards. Uh, of course, uh, there's also this nickname they sometimes call it sometimes, which is the Wall of Death. You'll hear that. I think that was a Western term, too, I think. Westerners kind of came up with Wall of Death because uh, maybe up to one million workers may have died building it over the years. Uh, although that they're not sure if it's that many. I think it's, I think they think anywhere from 100,000 to 1 million uh, may have died building the Great Wall of China. And of course, the story was that after people died, they would bury people inside the wall, but they've never really been able to, to prove that, that, that that actually happened. So uh, I think they've actually tried to study that and, and dig into the wall, but they've never found evidence of it, that people were buried in it. Uh, of course, the joke was is that the Great Wall of China was the longest cemetery on Earth, you know, <laughs> that kind of deal. Uh, average height of the Great Wall is about 25 feet tall. So that's about right. Uh, and then the width, that varies on the wall, but the width, at least 15 feet or 15 to 20 feet wide is about right. Um, if you look at pictures of the wall, which I'll give you... Um, Right here, uh, you can see that they also had watchtowers that they would build between certain sections of the wall, uh, that, which they would put guards in there uh, to guard parts of the of the wall in case they got attacked. Uh, they could then send reinforcements uh, and all that. Uh, so the Great Wall was actually built up like mountains and through deserts and um, and all that, which is pretty amazing some of the work that they did with this. Uh, now, the wall you're looking at now, which is, the, of course, the brick wall, of the Great Wall of China, uh, was not built till later. It was built more into modern times. You can see the wall goes from, like I said, the Yellow Sea to the Gobi Desert, but the brick version itself wasn't built until the Ming Dynasty came to power, which the Ming came to power in the 14th century, they began building the brick version of it. Why they build the brick wall you're looking at now, fortification? Uh, because of the Mongols. The Mongols in the, four, in the uh, 13th century invaded China, and they took over, I think wiped out half the population of China. And the Ming were able to push them out in the 14th century, so they didn't want the, the Mongols to come back. Uh, and so uh, they built this, you know, more uh, stronger uh, defense system here uh, to block them. Uh, and it lasted a while uh, until uh, the um, I think 17th century is how long it lasted as an actual fortification. You'll see in the video. But what happened was the Manchu, who were in Manchuria, eventually broke through the wall, I think in the 1640s, I believe it is. And um, yeah, the wall failed. There it is right there. The wall failed, of course. Uh, it became obsolete. Uh, and now it's just a tourist attraction <laughs> now in China. So, um, but the wall acted as like kind of like a transportation system, like a road system, you know, from east to west. Uh, trade, uh, use it as for trade and stuff like that uh, as well. So they could also use it to send reinforcements, you know, up and down the wall uh, if they needed to. But like I said, the wall's obsolete now, you know. All right. So um, anyway, kind of talk. There's a kind of a map too, showing you like where all the wall, you know, may have been built at one point all over the place. Uh, and um, it wasn't just one great wall. It was many walls uh, that were constructed. Uh, the one that's the most famous one is the one north of Beijing. That's around here. That's where all the tourists go uh, to look at stuff. 
All right. Now, I need to also talk about the other thing that Chen Shi Wong Di was known for. Of course, he had his famous terracotta army uh, that he constructed. And um, Chen Shi built a capital at a site called, it's, uh, it's called um, Sion Yang, uh, which I think now it's called Sion. It's been, of course, had different names. They've called that city. The other name they call it is Chang'an as well. I think it's the same thing. Uh, and um, it's kind of like Eastern Central China, uh, where he built this capital. So that became the imperial capital of China, which it was for a long time. Uh, today, Cyan has about a population of 12 million people there. So it's a pretty large city. I think at one point that city, one of the oldest capitals in China, was um, I think one of the first cities that had a million people living there, like one of the two million, at least in Asia. Uh, yeah, at one point back then. Uh, yeah, so it was a capital for a long time. Like, you know, I think for at least 1,200 years, I know it was a major capital up to like the Tang Dynasty, uh, up to like uh, ancient and medieval China uh, overall. And Xi'an or, uh, or uh, Chang'an, as they call it later, is where the Silk Road starts. We'll get We'll talk about the Silk Road later. Uh, but it starts right there, goes westward uh, towards like the rest of Asia, towards Europe, the Middle East. Uh, and so that was a very important city uh, a long time ago in ancient ancient China. Probably not as much as it used to be, but I think Beijing's now the big city, you know, uh, because that's where the capital is. Uh, but at one point, that was one of their main capitals uh, they had in ancient China. Now, of course, you're looking at the Terracotta Army. That's something that he, of course, is known for. Chen Shi built this mausoleum, which is a huge tomb uh, that he constructed. And he had about, like they said in the video, they had 700,000 workers that actually constructed uh, the actual tomb, which took many years. Well, they said 30 years to build. I don't know how many years it was. It was a bunch of years. I know it took them to build it. Uh, and um, the terracotta army was a sculpture of mostly uh, his soldiers, like his army that he would I guess, guard him in the afterlife, included some civilians. Probably the reason why they look unique is that they say that a lot of the sculptures that they made were actually modeled after real people. So I imagine people had to sit there and model for whatever sculpture that was being made. Uh, and this army of statues, of course, um, wasn't found until 1974. That's when they found the actual mausoleum of Emperor Chen Shi, and uh, it had like almost, I don't know if it's quite 8,000, but somewhere between seven and 8,000 of these uh, sculpture soldiers were found, warriors, terracotta warriors, they call them sometimes, uh, and uh, included also war chariots, about 130 uh, were discovered, and also horses, 520 sculptures of horses, which were, I guess, supposed to be attached to the chariots and all that, were supposed to be for the chariots, uh, and, um, and so quite a feat uh, what Chen Shi, Emperor Chen Shi did uh, during his reign. Uh, if you study about the uh, mausoleum, uh, it, um, it actually um, supposedly like some of the workers were buried alive in it. Um, and they, he wanted to do that because I guess he one of the main ones that worked on it, I guess, that knew how they built it. He uh, booby-trapped it, supposedly, and there was actually a lake of mercury that was put, I forget, it was very toxic, that was put inside of it, uh, I guess, to prevent people from going in there. Now, overall, uh, of course, about Chen Ji, like the video said, uh, he was ruthless. He was a ruthless ruler, uh, very much hated, uh, put a lot of people to work building various projects like his mausoleum, Great Wall of China. Uh, and so under him, a lot of people died. Um, and um, he was the one that kind of started adopting a new political theory called legalism, which legalism was a type of uh, uh, political philosophy where the Chinese believed that the government ought to be controlled by a central bureaucracy uh, with an emperor, basically. And uh, under the emperor, they have these um, um, these um, royal officials that would help run the government. They were called eunuchs. You hear a lot about this 
ancient China up through different dynasties. And eunuchs were basically these royal officials that were castrated. You know what that means, right? Uh, and uh, so they're kind of famous uh, under the Chinese, so-called eunuchs. I think Japan has the same thing too, I think, in ancient China and all that. Uh, Chen Shi banned a lot of books, of course, and he had books burned and stuff like that. Anything that was like not anything to do that was important, like farming or medicine, it was banned. So any kind of Chinese philosophy, uh, whether it be Confucianism, um, you know, Taoism, uh, he tried to stop the spread of Buddhism in the China. And there was even cases where he buried various scholars a lot. Yeah, buried them alive, which is crazy. So um, he may have had buried people buried alive in the Great Wall of China. Who knows about that story? Of course, he may have, I think they think he did bury people inside his mausoleum uh, and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, he was a very ruthless uh, ruler, uh, Chen Shi Wang Di. Now, what happened to his empire? Well, his empire collapsed. Uh, if you read about it, here's some more pictures, by the way. Uh, the terracotta soldiers. Oh, by the way, you can see that they have these like um, you can see their hands have like holes in them. And you can see that's where they put like the weapons, like swords or spears. Uh, I guess they, they held in their hands. And I think when they say they found some of the weapons that were still in the mausoleum, they were in fairly good condition. I think even some were even still pretty sharp, uh, believe it or not. So maybe they did use them against him. Uh, what happened was a new dynasty came in called the Han Dynasty, and they basically overthrew uh, the Qin Dynasty. So Qin had been ruling as an empire uh, since going back to 221 BC. Uh, and um, they believed that the Qin um, was overthrown by this Han Dynasty starting about 206 BC although it took about four years, 206 to probably about 202 B.C., uh, for the Han to overthrow them. Because uh, Chen Shi had like two sons that reigned as emperors. They were overthrown eventually, like the last one was. That led into the so-called Golden Age of China, which supposedly the Han kind of start at that point. The Han was one of the longest reigning imperial dynasties of China, reigning a little bit over 400 years, 415 or 20 years or something like that. And um, the picture there on the right, that is uh, the famous founder of the um, Han Dynasty, which is Liu Pang. Liu Pang was a Chinese commoner. He came from the lower class who was a general, uh, under, they think under likely Emperor Chen, Chen Shi, uh, and he eventually overthrew uh, the Qin dynasty, Qin dynasty, overthrew the empire and took over China. And he went on to become the first Han emperor. And uh, later on, they called him a name, which was Emperor Gao Su of the Han, which Gao Su meant supposedly uh, exalted emperor or great or high founder. I think it meant high founder or great founder or ruler. And um, that was his name after he, uh, I think after his death. I think when he was reigning, they called him Liu Pang, uh, basically. And um, they also called him Han Gao Su. So that's a, another name. So exalted emperor of the Han. And Han, by the way, supposedly was a name uh, that came from um, the Han River. There's a river in China called that, Han River, which may have been the origin of it. And, um, of course, the Han Chinese, you know, had a lot of influence on China. Most of the Chinese are kind of related or descended back to the Han. In fact, the Chinese language is mostly developed by the Han, which is something that they'll, of course, be famous for. Um, now, Liu Pang, or Gao Su, of course, uh, first Han emperor, when he would come in, he would start making reforms to China. Uh, he, of course, one of the first things he did was he embraced the ideas of Confucianism, which, you know, previous rulers like Chen Shi had tried to stop it, he even tried to, you know, bury alive Confucian scholars and so on. And, um, and so he adopted the you know, state Confucianism uh, for the Han state, 
Uh, they also, you can see there, adopted civil service exams. That was something that Confucius originally had wanted to do uh, to prevent corruption in the government. And so they wanted to create com competitive type tests uh, so people could, you know, work with the government and all of that. Something you see today, you know, civil service type, you know, tests and so on. So, so that's what basically he was known for, um, uh, Liu Pang or Emperor Gao Su. Now, they had, of course, another famous ruler uh, who's well known, which is Emperor Wu, who was often called Wu Di or Wu Ti. It's called different names. Usually, Emperor Wu of the Han is one of the names that they call him. And Wu Di or Ti means usually martial emperor. That's what it translates as mean, meaning. And um, he was considered one of their greatest rulers uh, of the Han dynasty. Uh, he reigned in the second to the first century BC. And he is one of the longest reign. He reigned about, I think, something like 54 years, roughly. Uh, although he, they don't think he's the longest reigning period. I think he might be second longest because uh, there was an emperor that reigned in the 17th century, which was like around 60 years. Now, he was known for a lot of things, emperor. Of course, you get his name there. Um, of course, he was a military-style emperor, known for his military successes, which most of that was, of course, expansion of China. Uh, and so under him, China began to expand into, like, Korea, which is kind of the eastern part of East Asia, also pushed into southern China, also into northern Vietnam. Vietnam was kind of influenced by the Chinese a little bit later. And also he did extend the Chinese empire into western China, mostly the northern western part of China, in the Gobi Desert region. Uh, I do have a map showing you uh, the area of what they take over eventually which is right here, you can see on the left. Uh, and um, the capital of China is the same capital, uh, of course, Xi'an, which is right here, but the later name they call it is Chang'an, be right here. You can see population of the Han uh, Dynasty and their empire, it's roughly may think maybe close to 60, 000, 60 million people, which is quite a lot. Chang'an at one point, I think, had a population, I don't want to say it's about the Tang Dynasty, of one to two million people living there, which is pretty large size population. I think almost like three, four percent of the population of China lived there. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one thing about uh, Emperor uh, Wu, uh, which is, of course, well known, Wu was uh, very good uh, at uh, pushing out the Shang Nu. That's why he was probably called the Martial Emperor because of his military successes in defeating the Shang Nu, uh, who lived like in that Mongolian steppe I told you about. And um, under him, he began pushing them back. And then that enabled the Han Dynasty to extend the Great Wall westward, well, which they will. If you watch that documentary later, I've got for you. Um, they'll talk about that. Uh, they push them westward and build the Great Wall uh, even more. And uh, also they extended the Great Wall uh, to protect the um, Silk Road, uh, which the Han Dynasty started building, they believe, under Emperor Wu. So he's one they think started it. And uh, the Silk Road, of course, was a famous, you know, a network of trade routes that ran from China and Asia all the way to the West, uh, like into parts of Western Asia, Middle East, uh, and also eventually linking up with Europe uh, overall. It's a debate about how long uh, the Silk Road is, but I think it's at least 4,000 miles or four to 5,000 miles in length. It's what they believe the length of it is at one point. And I told you that the Silk Road, uh, like it says, I think you can see in that, I think there's a slide talking about one of those later, I'll show you. They, they think the Silk Road pretty much started from the Chinese capital of Chang'an. I believe I got a picture of it here if you want to look at it, uh, which is right there. So it started at Chang'an uh, and 
went westward through part of India into Persia, uh, then uh, through I, what is Iraq and, and, and probably Turkey uh, eventually. Uh, and um, we talked about the Royal Road, I think it was. Yeah, the Royal Road. Uh, and um, the Royal Road is kind of like part of it. It kind of was like the Western part of it that linked up with uh, the West. And then um, after going through India, Persia, Arabia, and all that, of course, in the Middle East, it then linked up with the Roman Empire. And under the Han Dynasty, you know, they began trading with the Romans. That's something that's very famous at the time. And uh, they will do this for a while, uh, trade back and forth between East and West. Uh, there are routes later running northward, uh, like into like Mongolia, and you know, I think into like Russia uh, as well, like trade routes that kind of run north and south. Uh, as well. So those are all the areas that it kind of goes through as it goes westward. Uh, of course, they call it Silk Road, of course, uh, you know, because of silk being sold, you know, up and down the, the famous trade route. Uh, but you can see there, there's other goods that the Chinese also peddled to people as well. Gunpowder, of course, and paper. I think those are two big ones that were pretty big. Porcelain, that's why they call it China, you know, it's made in China. <laughs> you know, tea, spices, uh, technology like the crossbow, compass, and other things that Chinese invented uh, all came westward, uh, influenced the West a lot uh, over time. You can see I put that in there, which is kind of common now, of course. Uh, also, Asia, that part of East Asia, of course, is known for spreading a lot of diseases, uh, either through the trade routes or through the air. Uh, and, of course, one of the most famous was the bubonic plague. Bubonic plague, you know, was something that started in ancient China and spread westward along the trade routes. I think the Mongols helped spread it west. Uh, and um, bubonic plague, of course, was the worst plague in history, killing like 100 million people in the world. Um, of course, they think that, you know, the coronavirus, they think, started... Uh, in China, that's what some people call it, the China virus, I guess, or Wuhan virus. I think they dub it where it started in eastern China. Uh, and um, so that's not something that's fairly, you know, that old. You know, it's happening now. Uh, virus is being spread, of course. I think the swine flu, if you remember correctly, uh, 10, 12 years ago, whatever, uh, that started also originated from that part of Asia uh, as well. So. All right. Um, yeah, the Chinese were very secretive about stuff, not just like silk. I know like, like there was like a deal where like if anybody Chinese told anybody how they made silk, they'd put you to death. Uh, but the Chinese for years, you know, have been mistrustful of foreigners uh, and all that. So they don't like foreigners too much and kind of still like that in China. Uh, it's just been recently since like the uh, since, since the end of the Cold War, that they've kind of opened up more. But, you know, communist China, the way it is, it's still kind of very secretive about stuff. All right, moving on. Let me, of course, get into next. Um, we, of course, going to, uh, of course, yeah, there's a slide here talking about also some of the Han, achie Han achievements of the Han Dynasty uh, that's well known. Uh, the biggest thing they did, the Chinese, uh, the Han Dynasty, is they invented paper, uh, which was made from bamboo and wood, uh, and uh, that led to the development of books. So that's something that they they were, of course, known for, uh, the Han Dynasty. So they were the first to start printing books uh, overall. And uh, the uh, Han were known for a type of uh, printing format called woodblock or block printing, which uh, where they would like make these little tiny blocks uh, with calligraphy symbols on them. And they would use ink to print on like paper, seals or stamping or whatever. Uh, and that's how they developed early printing. This is all before Johann, Johann Gutenberg, who developed the printing press in Europe, uh, which is much later in the Middle Ages. Uh, and um, so they would use wood blocks to print with. And then later when Gutenberg developed his, they used like the blocks were made of metal you know, instead. So that's something the Han Han are known for, you know, 
very famously. Yeah, they may have developed some of those, like the iron plow wheelbarrow or some things that may have been invented, compass, et cetera. Uh, those are some ideas. But some of those ideas have kind of been around in the West as, as well, like sundial, I think, and stuff like that have kind of been around. Water mill, I think, pretty much was in the West. They had that too, stuff like that. All right. Uh, also, one more thing about the Han. The Han is sometimes divided into two periods. They have what they call the former Han and the Western Han, uh, which goes down to 206 to about 9 CE. And then you've got the uh, later called the later Han or Eastern Han, which was the second half. What happened was there was some kind of um, revolt that happened in the Han dynasty and their empire. And uh, this ruler named Wang Mang took over as emperor. He had his own dynasty called the Zen dynasty, X-I-N. He briefly reigned for a decade or two uh, until he was overthrown. And so that's why the Han's divided into two periods. We usually call the former and latter Han, but they also call it the Western and Eastern Han. So I don't think it's that as, as that important, but that is kind of something kind of, kind of different about uh, the Han dynasty uh, there. But they are one of the longest reigning imperial dynasties uh, of China, uh, of, like, you know, having emperors and all that. Uh, I did want to talk about um, uh, another dynasty briefly, just for a few minutes. I pretty much finished most of the lecture on China, but uh, I did want to talk, I've got time. I did want to talk about the Tang dynasty that came in. That was a little later. Uh, the Tang dynasty uh, ruled China from the 7th to the 10th century CE. Uh, they were considered one of the last major dynasties of the Chinese Golden Age, uh, which peaked about that time, so in the late antiquity, early Middle Ages. And um, they, had, of course, kind of took the capital of Zian, Xi'an. They expanded it, built a larger city, which became known as Chang'an. That's actually what they term it. They call it later, uh, the Tang, which means, by the way, perpetual peace what it means in Chinese. And uh, that city, of course, I told you, was considered one of the first major cities in the world, at least in Asia, that had a million people living there, like one to two million people. Uh, so it was a pretty large city. Uh, and um, they, yeah, they were more liberal in their attitude about things. Uh, and uh, they, they say that the peak of, you know, Chinese culture really starts pretty much here. It's when it peaks overall. Chinese art, Chinese pottery, like Tang pottery is very expensive, you know, um, very valuable. Uh, Chinese poetry, literature kind of peaks. Also, Buddhism in China became very popular. So it spreads throughout pretty much all of China up to that point. Uh, and Taoism also became popular. as well. They already had Confucian as it was popular, but those two became very popular overall. Uh, these were some of the famous rulers they had. I'll give, I'll give you two of them at least, but Emperor Gao Su, whose original name was Li Yuan, uh, was the founder of the Tang Dynasty. He founded it sometime uh, in the early part of the 7th century uh, CE or AD. Uh, also, one thing about the Tang, which was very famous, they had the only female ruler, uh, which was Empress Wu, up and called Wu Chao. Uh, she reigned too later in the, I think at the end of the seventh century. And so that's something else kind of unique about the Tang and a female ruler. And I think she was like some kind of ex mistress of one of the emperors who seized power after he died. Uh, so kind of interesting about that. Uh, the Tang was also the dynasty that helped complete the Grand Canal. That and another dynasty called the Su, S-U-I, I think how they spell it. And uh, the, the uh, Grand Canal or Great Canal uh, was an intercoastal type canal system that the Chinese built on their east coast uh, that linked up the Yellow to the Yangtze River basins. Uh, and so that enabled the Chinese uh, to expand trade uh, in their economy on the east coast. Uh, made shipping stuff easier, I guess, from like the Yellow River to the Yangtze Valley, because that was like really the most important area of China and still, I guess, part of their economy today. Uh, and so they still use the Grand Canal. 
pretty, it's pretty much used today. It's kind of similar to what we got. Like we have that intercoastal canals that we've got too along the you know, U.S. Co Louisiana coast, I guess, goes from Texas across Louisiana, or whatever. So it's kind of similar to that, you know, uh, as well. So anyway, yeah, you can see golden age of foreign relations with other countries. So Japan, Korea, Persia, yeah, they're trading with all these areas, you know, in, at the time uh, as well. And so, yeah, the Tang, the Tang period is really the peak of China. And after that, in the Middle Ages up to the early modern period, China is not as powerful uh, as a state. Uh, what will happen later is that the Mongols will later invade China, 13th century, and the Mongols actually rule uh, to the 14th century. And then you have actually two more dynasties later that reign, which are the Ming dynasty, the one that built the Great Wall of China behind me, uh, the brick one, brick version. And you have the Manchu dynasty, which was the last dynasty that reigned to about 1912 uh, overall. So China's had dynasties that have reigned up of emperors that have reigned up to the 20th century. So they've, they've had, you know, dynasties of emperors for like something like 20, 2100 something years, which is a really long time uh, overall. Now, of course, the Chinese Communist Party run, runs over run the whole thing now, which, of course, they took over China after World War II, you know, and all that. That's another thing in history, of course, we won't talk about. All right. So, yeah, I've got a few minutes left. Let me go ahead and quickly review. And that's it for today. Uh, so uh, I talked earlier already, but what was the period of the warring states that occurred before the advent of Imperial China? Uh, that was, of course, a period from 481 to 221 B.C. when China was ruled by seven rival uh, Chinese kingdoms. Uh, that kind of ruled over the state or vassal states. Uh, and what happened was over time, there was a kingdom called Qin or Qin, which was a dynasty, eventually conquered all of China. And they formed it into one empire, which was called the Qin Empire or Qin Empire, hence the name China being used. Uh, who was the first emperor of China? That was Qin Shi, uh, yeah, Qin or Qin Shi, Usually Chen Shi, is what they call him, or Chen Shi, or Chen Shi Wang Di, which is the long name, which you see right here, Chen Shi Wang Di. Some people call him Emperor Chen or Emperor Qin. Uh, there's variations on the name of how they say it. What famous fortification does he begin building? Uh, Emperor Chen, of course, was famous for constructing the Great Wall of China, uh, which was built on their northern border. Why did he build it? What foreign invaders were the Chinese attempting to block from attacking into China? He built it to block barbarians from invading China from the north, uh, mostly the Shang Nu, uh, who were maybe descendants of the Huns or the Mongols. And so it was mostly primarily built to block out the Mongols uh, from invading China. Uh, what is the nickname of the Great Wall of China and how it was built? Uh, it's called all kinds of names. Of course, Great Wall of China is the modern name. They call it now, which foreigners gave it. Uh, they call it the 10,000 Li Wall because uh, they think it was at least 5,000 kilometers in length. Uh, also called the Wall of Death, uh, the Chinese Wall. Those are all names. Uh, it was called the original wall was built with like earth and mud, like rammed earth. Uh, and then the Ming Dynasty built, of course, the brick, you know, fortification that's there now. Uh, what capital did Chen Shi built his massive tomb? That was Zion, Zion Yang, uh, which is also called other names like Chang An. And also today they also call it Xi'an, X-I-A-N. Uh, and, and of course, uh, he built his massive mausoleum. What guarded it? Uh, that was the Terracotta Army. Terracotta Army was this statue army, about almost 8,000 clay st statues he built, uh, and um, they were supposed to guard it in the afterlife. Uh, but uh, his tomb later wasn't found until the 1970s, 1974. Uh, what dynasty conquered the Qin or Qin dynasty, their empire? That was the Han, H-A-N. Uh, the founder was a ruler named Lu Pang, who also went by a later name after his death. 
which was Geosu, Emperor Geosu or Keosu. Uh, the greatest ruler was Emperor Wu or Wu Di, Wu Ti. And Emperor Wu of the Han uh, ruled about 54 years. He was one of the longest reigning rulers. Uh, he was called the Martial Emperor because of his um, military victories against like the Shang Nu and is also his expansion of China, expanding it southward into southern China, Vietnam, Korea, and also western China. Uh, what trade route ran westward that started under Han, I think founded probably by Emperor Wu, the Han, uh, that was, of course, the, the Silk Road. Also, it's called Silk Route. They call it different names. Uh, but the Silk Road uh, was a major road that ran from trade route from um, China and Asia. And it ran westward uh, through India, Persia, uh, Arabia, into the Middle East, probably part of Turkey, and then to eventually Europe, where the Romans were. Uh, what were some innovations of the Han? The Han, of course... Well, one thing I didn't mention about the Han developed like Han Chinese, which became like their main language uh, over time, the Chinese, uh, which is where you get the different dialects of Chinese like Mandarin. Uh, and um, Han were the first to develop books, uh, which were made from paper, uh, like bamboo and wood paper. Uh, and uh, I didn't mention it, but the Chinese were the, the Han were the first to develop like the first Chinese dictionaries, like that listed like their language. Uh, and all that. Uh, they also developed like wood block printing or block printing, uh, which they were known uh, for being the first to print with. Uh, the Tang the Tang Dynasty also did some printing as well later on. Uh, also, like I think they mentioned about the iron plow, something they invented uh, as well, um, possibly about that time. Uh, of course, they divided up the Han period in the two periods, there's the, um, of course, they had the Western Han and the Eastern Han, uh, which, if you remember correctly, uh, right here, uh, the Western Han was called the former Han, and the Eastern Han was called the latter Han. So, kind of confusing, but that's what they were called, because there was a brief period between those two states uh, when there was one called the Zen Dynasty that reigned. Uh, what is the nickname of ancient China around the period of the Han and also the Tang Dynasty layer that rules? They call it the Golden Age of China. So it's one of the nicknames they call it China. So that's like like late, late ancient times and early Middle Ages, what I guess would be the period of it. All right. So anyway, um, that's pretty much it for my lecture uh, part two, of course, on ancient China. Um, if you have any questions, um, it's like we don't have any questions right now. Uh, but um, if you have any other further questions, you know, let me know later. Uh, of course, I will be posting this lecture, uh, of course, to my YouTube channel uh, after I finish uh, streaming uh, this lecture, Facebook Live. Um, uh, before I go, I want to remind you about a few things. Uh, remember, Thursday, Friday is fall break. So pretty much, I guess, no classes uh, this week. But you probably will have assignments to complete. I told you you got the one on the Persian Empire, Phoenicians, Israelites. Uh, you need to wrap up. And I did put a new uh, assignment up today, uh, which is a video quiz on uh, the Great Wall of China. Uh, so that's due next week. Uh, so go ahead uh, and start working on that. Um, and um, also, don't forget, um, vocab is due, I think, next Wednesday is the actual day. Uh, Wednesday, October the 14th. So start, you know, turning that in by next week uh, to me uh, for points. And that's about it uh, for uh, this lecture. Um, so let me know later. I don't think anybody has any questions right now, I guess. Uh, but let me know later uh, if you have any comments, questions about this lecture. Eventually, we will have a Canvas quiz, of course, on these part one and two lecture on China. But next week, I am going to have a quick canvas quiz coming up on ancient India. So that's coming up next. Uh, China's later going to be on an exam, but India's probably not going to be on the second exam. I think I've decided that I'm just going to have a major quiz on India, and that's probably it. So that's it for today. Uh, hope you all have a good 
uh, fall break and weekend coming up. Of course, they got that hurricane, but hopefully it kind of pushes to the west. I'm hoping it doesn't come this way and affect us. So y'all take care and have a good one. So take care.